Thank you for uh, for attending today. It makes a lot better when uh, people do show up to, to meetings like this, and you know, having the opportunity to listen to Joel. Um, I don't know if anybody has ever listened to him before, but an awesome uh, resource. So, uh, a lot of good things to to be picking up today. So. So yes, I've uh, been uh, farming in, in eastern uh, Saskatchewan, middle of Canada, and uh, uh, end up selling the farm and saw an opportunity here. So hopefully, with, if everything goes right, uh, we'll be here for a long time. So we've been playing around with cover cropping uh, on our farm in, in eastern Saskatchewan. So it's uh, a little different, but yet very similar to here. I've, I've covered through uh, all of Western Canada and we've gone through areas that are quite a bit drier than you and not quite as wet as you, but once again, the, the, the snow, snow changes things a little bit. So, <laughs> so here's one of the examples of, uh, of the cover crops uh, that we've designed. And as we start getting into these cover crops and, and plant diversity, this is usually where a lot of people feel that we're, we're stuck. We're at the stop sign, we can't turn left, can't turn right, can't go, what do we do? And after talking to a lot of the, uh, the producers, the number one problem is, what do we grow, where do we get the seed? So that's something that I'm gonna be working on the next little while, but, uh, but basically, you know, what is a cover crop? And the, the quick definition of what a cover crop is, is to grow plants to help protect and improve the soil. Simple as that. You can twist it different ways, but in the big picture, we're growing the plants to protect the soil. And why are we doing that? Because one of the things, if another great speaker that uh, one of my mentors that I, I lean on as long as, jo as well as Joel is Jay Fear out of, uh, out of North Dakota. And one of the things that he says is plants fix dirt. Simple as that. And when you think about how soils are developed, plants develop soil. So if we have dirt, what is the definition of dirt? It's life without soil, or life, it's, it's soil without life. And as we put life into dirt, we create soil. And how do we do that? We do that through plants. When do we wanna do this? We wanna maintain that living root throughout the, in the soil for as many days as possible. I've been saying this for, for 10 years. The stuff that I've seen on our operation is when we have this living root, especially in the vegetative stage, as long as we can throughout that whole growing season, magic happens. Because as Joel said, in, you know, in the life cycle of an annual plant, 20 to 30% of the carbon that's captured through photosynthesis is released back into the soil's root exudate. But when the plant is in the vegetative stage, it is priming the soil and the microbiology in the soil for future nutrients, right? So when we go through and we have a plant in vegetative stage, up to 80% of the carbon it captures through photosynthesis gets released into the soil. As the plant matures, once again, you saw the curve, all of a sudden that starts dropping off and then the, metabol the, the root exudates do change and become less resistant to microbial breakdown. That's a different story, but the biggest thing we want to do is have that plant in the vegetative stage. That's, that's one of the keys. So when we look at these cover crops, you know, what are the different types? You know, we have the pre-seed cover crop, we have a, a relay cover crop, intercropping, post-harvest or capture cover crop, full season cover crops, nurse, a nurse crop. We have our green manures. And that's all great, you know, to put these titles on. I don't care what you call them or how you want to twist it around. You know, what, it all goes back to your goals. Once, the, you, once you say that, okay, you come to me and you say, yeah, I want to grow a cover crop, the first thing I'm going to ask you is, what is your goal? What are you trying to do? What is your problems? What are you trying to, to, to address? Is it feed? Is it, uh, jumping ahead of myself, you know, is it uh, uh, weed suppression? Is it water infiltration? Is it, uh, uh, is it feed? Is it silage? Is it grazing? Uh, or you have erosion issues, or you're trying to sequester more carbon, or you're trying to increase your soil fertility. What are the things that you're going to measure at the end of the year, end of the growing season, to say, I grew this cover crop, did it work? And I've had people in the past where they said, yes, I grow uh, some radishes, and it didn't increase my, 
my nitrogen in my system. Well, if you would have asked me, I wouldn't have told you to grow a radish to increase your nitrogen. It will increase it somewhat because of the high protein, but once again, it's not, its function in the system is not to have, to, to produce nitrogen. And once again, this is uh, normally in, in uh, eastern Saskatchewan, we get about 20, 200 mils of, of rain during the growing season. And that's that first picture you saw, that's 200 mils, that's all, all we get, plus some snow. Uh, there's some years during uh, 2010 to 2014, uh, we were getting uh, about 40 inches of rain. <laughs> so we went from 8 inches to 40 inches. It absolutely messed everything up, so it's uh, really tough to manage when you go to, that, to those extremes. So when we want to grow these cover crops, you know, the things that we want to do is increase our plant diversity. And we'll talk about that a little bit when we start talking about functional plant groups. That's the key to all of this is functional plant groups. Uh, we want to increase the, um, the diversity of our root systems. So fibrous, deep taps, um, when they're growing, how they're growing, all those good things. Keep that green plant growing throughout that whole growing season. And once again, address these goals of what, why we're growing this cover crop. So one of the things when we're talking about these functional plant groups, I first started out with a nice simple triangle because once again, how many decisions do we have to make in a day? Well, let's keep this simple so it's actually manageable. So I started out with a triangle and I started out with the three functional plant groups of grasses, legumes, and broadleaf, right? Then I looked at the broadleaf group and I said, there's way too much diversity in there. So I have another second little triangle of brassicas, non-brassicas, and forbs. Within each one of those groups, we have access to warm season, cool season species. We have annuals, biannuals, and perennials. So when we're looking at these functional plant groups, so we have in the grasses, we have warm and cool season species. We have annuals, biannuals, and perennials. When we start looking at all of the potential options, if we have six potential groups under each one of them, and we have five, we have 30 different functional plant groups that we could be working with. This is where diversity comes from. And when we're looking at, you know, whether, well, do you need to have all 30 growing in the, in the field at one time? No. But how do we incorporate those? Where do they fit? What are the strengths? What do they do in an ecosystem? So we want to have as many plant groups incorporated in our system as possible, uh, whether it's in blends or in rotation. We want to add brown and green residues to our soils. That's really important because what it does to our soil biology, how our, our soils, how they build, how they, they the, if we're going to be doing some, some grazing, how the animals actually graze. Uh, there's uh, a, a few, uh, YouTube videos out there where they put GoPros on animals and they watch them graze and how they graze. How they'll go up and they'll sniff one plant and they won't eat that one but they'll come and eat this one in the morning but in the afternoon they'll go back and they'll eat that one they sniff but they didn't eat. So it's really interesting once again how the, the nose works and, and how the, uh, the, the bricks and the, the room and all drives this whole system. Uh, and then when we're adding the livestock to the system under a good grazing management, it builds soil. And once again, it's not the cow, it's the how when we're going through whether that animal is going to build soil or destroy soil. And uh, if you listen to David Montgomery and, and, uh, and, and read the uh, uh, dirt, the erosion of a civilization, he's got some really good examples in there. So I put together a couple of blends. One of the things that I've been doing in, uh, in Western Canada is the, the vine, the designing blends for producers and so you know whether people come to me with their blends and and uh, and say what do you think or they say okay this is these, these are my goals what do we do so this is one example of a, a blend that a, a producer sent to me so using some perennial ryegrass two different varieties some festiolium which is a hybrid between Italian ryegrass and uh, and and fescue so my Italian ryegrass, some oat, barley, uh, triticale, and wheat. They said, what do you think of that blend? I said, realistically? So what I've done on this side is type. And you see that they're all the same plant group. Cool season grass. And in this case, 
the only diversity in here is you have an, a perennial, a biennial, and an annual. So three fun functional plant groups. Look at this blend. So now we're looking at perennial ryegrass, which is a, a cool season perennial grass. We have some Japanese millet, uh, blanking on what you guys call it here, but you guys have access to it. So warm season grass annual. You have some Persian clover, which is an annual clover. You have your lucerne, your alfalfa, which is your perennial legume. You have your sunflowers, which is a, a warm season broadleaf. Uh, and that's uh, a non-brassica. You have your chicory, which is a forb. You have your turnips, which is your brassica. You have your beet, which is not a brassica. It, it acts like a brassica, but it's uh, from the, the non-brassica group. And some oats. So putting that blend together, now we're in including a lot more functional plant diversity. When you have a blend like this, as compared to that first one, that next year your soils are going to look completely different. You're going to see some, some changes, assuming that, once again, plant nutrition is, is, is in, uh, in balance and, and you have things functioning. So when we start talking about catch cover crops, what we're actually doing is playing catch and release with nutrients. So we're going to capture these nutrients, and now, once again, what's your goal? When you're designing these blends, I, I'm always asking, what is your goal? What are you trying to do? So if you're going into something that is very rich, lots of, of potentially free nutrients in the soil, how quickly do you want those tied up? How quickly do you want them released? That's going to depend on what species or, or you know, push you what direction you want to be, what species you're going to be using. And part of that is going to be, you know, you know you're going to manage your carbon to nitrogen ratios in that residue. And that's, you know, that's all going to you know, drive this whole system. When we're looking at capture, these capture crops, so this is usually after harvest, what we want to do is, number one, have these nutrient scavengers. So in a lot of cases, this is where the brassicas have a real nice fit. Buckwheat, sunflowers, uh, the other two. We want to have some fast-growing plants. We want fast-growing because any free nutrients in the system, we want to grab and tie up real fast. We want to have these various root structures. So we want to have the shallow fibrous roots. We want to have some deep tap roots. We want to make sure that any nutrients in that soil profile is going to be captured and brought up and stored for us instead of having it, losing it. And this is where we start talking about, you know, these uh, shoulder uh, season growth. So it's kind of after, after the fact that we've grown our crop, we've, we've, we've developed our cash flow that year. Now, either before or after, we want to make sure we tie up those nutrients so that we, we have that living root, we're building soil. So when we start talking about these carbon to nitrogen ratios, this is you know, going to determine how quickly this residue starts breaking down. So if we're dealing with wider, res wider carbon to nitrogen ratios, that's going to be a slower breakdown, but that's going to be creating soil armor. We want that soil armor because once we get above 40 degrees Celsius in the soil, what happens to your soil microbes? They get grumpy and they want to die. Exactly. But the negative thing is then you get more oxidation. So, okay. so this narrow, uh, narrow carbon to nitrogen ratio, it's going to you know, start breaking down quicker. Your younger plants tend to have a narrow C to N ratio where your more mature plants, they start lignifying, it becomes wider. Wider C to N ratio ties up nitrogen. Your narrow C to N releases more nitrogen when it starts rotting or growing. So, you know, this is where managing this carbon in our system is really quite important. Because as we have that excess carbon in the system, in this, this mobile carbon cycle that we have, we have to, you know, it's going to really influence where we are in the nitrogen. So our green manures, once again, you know, when we're doing the green manures traditionally, uh, any organic producers here today? Okay, okay. So when we go through and we're organic, what we want to do with nitrogen, how, do you want to go buy it? Or once again, being from Eastern Saskatchewan, um, my heritage is Ukrainian Scottish. So if you see anybody cheaper than me, I want to meet them. <laughs> so if I can get something for free, I'm going to grab it and I'm going to run. 
And when I found out that, you know, there's these special plants in, that we can grow that takes nitrogen from our air and puts it into the soil so that other plants can use it. I thought, oh, cool, this is neat. And so after uh, the, the first six years of, of farming, we started growing some different crops. We, you know, I was looking at the nitrogen requirements and nitrogen cycles and, and, and economics. And after seven years, I was able to start cutting back the nitrogen that I was using. And for the last 15 years of farming, I did not buy any nitrogen. And I wasn't using a lot of livestock in my system. I was using a lot of legumes. So, you know, using these legumes, great way to, you know, get this nitrogen to get going. But when we start looking at how the legumes have evolved through time, they have never evolved through monocultures. It's always these mixes. And one of the things that when you start looking at these mycorrhizae communities, the whole, when we start doing these mixes and the plant, the, one of the plants are under stress, that plant that's under stress is going to be helped by these other plants. The, 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 the community needs everybody to survive. So they'll help them out as much as they can, unless you're dealing with something that, you know, very tropical and you're growing it in, uh, uh, in, a, in a dry environment and, and, you know, eventually they'll just give up the ghost. But these are the things that we need to do is having this diversity and, and getting this, acute, this uh, society that, that we have out in the field functioning properly. And so when you have a grass, grasses tend to accumulate phosphate. Nitrogen, or the, the nitrogen fixing legumes, they require a lot of phosphate. On the flip side, the grass needs that nitrogen. So it's in the best interest for a grass and a legume to be growing together because that grass will, will capture extra phosphate, move that over through mycorrhizae to that legume, that legume will be able to fix more nitrogen to share back to the grass. In this case, you know, adding some chicory into it, once again, that adds more plant diversity, a different root system. It, it makes that whole system work. So those are the things that, that we want to do, be looking at. Traditionally, once again, what did you do with your green manure plant crop when you grew it? You worked it in. Okay, so what happens if we mow it, clip it? What happens if we graze it? What happens if we do some haying and then we graze it instead of actually going out and tilling? because that's going to be changing you know, a lot of the, the good things that we have been doing. So there's these, these challenges of, of doing things differently. So once again, grass, legume, broadleaf, when we start adding the diversity in there, we throw some sunflowers in there, uh, we have a little bit of oats, we have whatever, get this whole system going. And one of the things that I'm a strong proponent of is when we are out in the field, taking a look at weeds. That's one of the questions when we're setting goals. What weeds do you have? Why are those weeds growing? Those weeds are growing because they have ecological advantage over what we're trying to grow. So when we're having problems with production and we have all these weeds, what are those weeds telling us? So these are the things, once again, as we go through looking at systems, you know, what's growing, and we talked about this uh, at, at the tea break, is replacing a weed that you have with a plant in the same functional plant family. So if we're seeing, you know, thistle problems using a, something like chicory, real nice replacement. And then you'll see those, those uh, dandelions or, or thistles start disappearing. So this is a great thing about hanging around Joel when he's doing his presentations. Uh, if you, and you're, if you're in the middle of it, I get to add to it as, as he's talking, because as he was talking about the, the different, you know, the, the root structures, you know, this is a, once again, from, from Western Canada, do you need to know what the species are on the bottom? Well, you might, you might, might not, but it just gives a quick visualization of what, you know, we always see from here up, rarely do we see bottom down. So we need to understand what some of these roots look like. And what are the roots are doing? So, you know, something like chicory is going to be more like this, whereas, you know, your grasses are going to be more like that. And when we have monocultures, so instead of having this nice diversity of, of the different roots going underneath, imagine if we just had all of these roots. What's going to happen? Now you're cut off here. And actually, in reality, when we start talking about monocultures, when those roots start interacting, same roots, you're going to have a negative feedback. 
so the roots are going to get pruned back even more. So that instead of being here, now we're only here because of competition, because of stress. When we had this diversity, now we're dealing with synergies, synergies in the system. And that's once again what Joel was talking about earlier. We need to know these functional plant groups and how they interact, how they work with, with each other or against each other. Uh, so, you know, when we're growing cover crops, you know, number one, we need to create this soil armor. Keep that ground cool. And, uh, you know, when we have that, that living mulch on top, it really cools the, the soil better than just having dead. Uh, the, the living plant does so many positive things. And one of the things when we start talking about our, you know, the soils here and how different they are, you know, we can't do that because it's too dry. We can't do that because... I keep looking at the diversity out in nature and all of the plants that are flowering during this hot, dry summer of yours. What does nature know that we don't? How do we do change to make it so we can tap into that moisture that these flowering plants are using? Because flowering plants need a lot of water, need a lot of nutrition. So what are they doing differently than what we are? So. So that armor, really important, green and brown. Uh, we need to keep that living root in the soil, keep those root exudates going. We need the plant diversity, so those functional plant groups are really important. Uh, we need to reduce the amount of synthetics. Once again, when I'm talking, you know, I don't talk about getting rid of all tillage. I'm not talking getting rid of all synthetics. It's once again, smarter use. One of the things we did on the farm is we switched from growing a lot of wheat to triticale because it needs half the nutrient requirements of what wheat needs. Worked out the economics of it, it penciled out. So that's the direction we went. Uh, involvement of, of livestock in your system is great, uh, but basically at the end of the day, diversity trumps density when we start talking about cover crops and intercropping. Something like this. What would, how would you rate this? Was this a wreck? And this is from Western Australia, so it isn't something that I just butchered up at, at home. Huh? That's a wreck, right? What's that doing in the soil? Especially when you look across the fence where nothing. You have living root. You're capturing sunlight. You're putting root exudates in the soil. What's bad with that? So the eye beholder. So this is... Uh, one of the, the little experiments I did on, on our farm in, in uh, eastern Saskatchewan, custom feeding some bison. My problem was, okay, the truck was, my ute was there and uh, the bison were there, how am I gonna get over? But they were happy, they were more curious than anything else. So these are the things when, when you know, the reason why I got into this, so you know, I, I was a cropper, I don't know anything about animals. I'm an agronomist, I know how to grow stuff. Guess what, if you understand the nutritional needs of animals, being an agronomist and being a grain farmer, this is adding more diversity because this white stuff out here, not too many people are out there farming in that. They're usually you know, moving grain, doing other stuff. They're not making money on this land. Whereas with these critters, I'm making 80 cents per animal per, per day. And I'm improving soil. I have a living, well, <laughs> I have lots of pictures. But if you dive in here, there's green plants underneath this. And those bison are going in there and they're grazing and, and uh, they, you know, it, it worked really well. So, questions, comments? How are we doing for time? Oh, you, I, I would expect, I would be disappointed if you didn't have a question. <laughs> um, so, in my mind, that's really great for grazing and for pasture and that sort of stuff, but how do we, turn that into cash cropping like what a lot of Western Australia is, it's very, very heavily cropped and not grazed. Right. Is it only that we can do multi-species cropping and we have to start seed cleaning to get all of our oats out and our farmer out and all that sort of stuff? Or is there other ways that you can do it more effectively and still be a cash crop and still be effective in multi-species? Good question. So when we start, once again, what's the goal? Um, Make money. <laughs> I'm, I'm being serious. Yeah. Like that's it. If you don't make money, you don't farm. Absolutely. So when we're looking at, uh, I don't know why this isn't. 
So when we start talking about goals, and that's where you know this goal thing is, is so crucial. I kept it fairly general because I didn't know who I was going to be talking to today. So, uh, so when we start looking at the cropping system, so what the goal is under a cropping system is producing money, I want to have some uh, nitrogen fixation, I want to suppress weeds, I want to build soil. So now what we would do is use, and once again, I've talked to some, some local seed suppliers, I've talked to some local producers, and a lot of the species that are being offered here are the same ones we're using in Western Canada. Subterranean clover, use a lot of it. Persian clover, use lots of it. And these are the things when we start looking at, and once again, it's what kind of header do you have? What crop are you growing? What's your nutrient requirements? Uh, what's your past? Are you going to do any grazing on? All of those questions come in. So when we go through and, and I'm producing a, a, a plan for a, a, a cash cropper, what we're looking at is, okay, so which ones do we want to check off? So in a lot of cases, I'll use a, uh, and, doesn't, and they don't want to do any separation. They just want to do soil improvement and I want to grow wheat. So under that wheat, what I would recommend is using subterranean clover and Italian ryegrass. Those are the two really easy ones because both of them are nice and grow, uh, low growing. You can cut it. Now if that, those, that cover crop's going to continue growing right up until it dies, whether you terminate it or you let it go or you graze it. It's nice and simple. When we start looking at separation, We'll talk about the intercropping and go through, through some economics. But we want to pick species that might grow nice and low underneath the cutting bar. If you go to a stripper header, now we can deal with something a little taller. If we're going in with, um, you know, a small seeded stuff, uh, we can go maybe some larger, like larger plants, large seeds. So this way we can do some separation in, in, in the, the harvester without even getting that far. So if it's something like phacelia, something extremely light for a cover crop, even sunflowers, we might be able to blow them out the chopper and not have to worry about separation, and we have our cash crop in the bin. So I love simplicity. How complex do you want to get? Well, we can crank it up, but... Anything else? I'm pushing through, so we're getting close on time. <laughs> So one of the crops that, uh, one of the mixes that are, are used in, in Western Canada, because uh, canola is the, the, the golden child of, of farmers in Western Canada, which I still don't understand why, but um, canola. What's the problem with canola? Well, I've okay, got a lot of problems, but that's besides the point. Uh, end use is number one, never mind the bugs, never mind disease, all the other good stuff, especially when you grow it back to back and, and decide that uh, having a snow in between is, is good agronomic practice. But that's, that's completely besides the point. So one of the producers up in the northeastern part of Saskatchewan, uh, they started growing some peola, so peas and canola. And he, good, he, his wife is an agronomist, so he's, she said, let's do a trial. Let's have them side by side. Let's manage them. Let's, uh, let's see what, the, what it turns out to be. So apologize for the small numbers, but if anybody's interested, I'll, I'll share this. Uh, so up in, uh, in the area, they have 2.8% 2, 2 organic matter. They have uh, 9 uh, pounds per acre, so 9 kilos per hectare. You, you Aussies really baffle me. The Americans laugh at us because we talk about liters per acre. Here you guys, some talk kilos, some talk pounds, some acre. So <laughs> it, if, if you need conversion, let me know. <laughs> So nine pounds of uh, nitrate, nitrogen uh, per acre, 21 pounds of phosphate, uh, 202 pounds of potassium, 14 pounds of sulfur, and then there's micros and all the other good stuff. So they went in um, and they did a, a burn off with some glyphosate. Uh, they seeded June the 6th in uh, 2022, which is a little later than what I would like to seed. And usually the long weekend in, in May, which is the third week, is normally when I like having all the crop in. but. Um, Things happen. So they used some, uh, some phosphate and sul uh, sulfur uh, blend mid-row, which they, 17 pounds. There's uh, the, the, the prescription map where they, they uh, used the, the variable rate fertilizer. Uh, they rolled everything. Canola was in the third leaf. Peas were in the fourth node. Uh, June 28th, uh, they put on a little more nitrogen to keep the, the canola happy. Uh, they sprayed uh, some herbicide first part of July, 
Um, in the insect control, um, you know, the peas are starting to flower the first or the middle of, of July. Uh, peas were 40% flowers, load when uh, the aphids hit. Uh, so they, they use some conventional or like some uh, insecticide because in, the aphids started getting a little bit too high. Um, and once again, they're very early, early in their regenerative uh, uh, program, so they still have that disease and, and bug issues. Um, da -da -da. So nuts and bolts. And this got a lot blurrier than I, I saw on my screen. So basically, they went through and they, they put in all of their, uh, their canola seed, pea seed, uh, the cost of the burn off, uh, seeding uh, fertilizer, top dressing fertilizer, herbicide, insecticide. Uh, they desiccated because they got into a wet fall. Um, aerial spraying, fungicides. So their total inputs per acre is $235.70. Uh, their pea yield. <laughs> Uh, per acre was uh, just under 35 bushels an acre, so about a ton per acre, which is 2.4 tons per, per hectare. So the revenue on the peas was about $448. Their canola yield was about half a ton per acre at 24 bushels an acre. And so they end up grossing $898.73, which leaves them a net of 663. Monocrop canola, um, their seed burn off, uh, seeding fertilizer, uh, their extra fertilizer mid row, the herbicide, it turned out to be $181.41 per acre for, for cost. Uh, 32 bushel canola crop at 19 bucks a bushel gives them 608 per, for a revenue, which leaves them a, a net of 426. So growing this cover crop netted them an extra $240 an acre. And there's so many more because of the fact that if they were further along, once again, as Joel said, what are the goals? So in this case, if in my, my recommendation would be to crank the peas up that much more and get rid of most of that fertilizer. Because in a lot of that stuff, because see, they're, they're still in the mindset of looking at the soil test and saying, oh, okay, the soil test says I need, I would be cutting a lot of that back, especially in, in, in eastern Saskatchewan because our phosphate load in the soil is, uh, uh, Elaine Ingham is, uh, estimates we have about uh, 2,000 years of phosphate in our soil, but our soil test shows up as only being 10 parts per million. But that's that whole availability versus what's in the soil. So when we start growing some of these crops together, all of a sudden, you know, what does it look like? So here's your peas, there's our, our canola growing side by side that come onto the ground. Um, it canopies up really nice. Peas growing up it kind of get held up by the canola, so this way it doesn't grow flat on you. Uh, there was some problems because, once again, the, the over-application of nitrogen, and that's the key is the over-application, is all of a sudden the, some of the stuff won't die. And this is one of the things we'll see in Western Canada is because we've been over applying all this nitrogen, our crops stay greener longer. And because we only have 110 days from you know, getting in the ground to putting it in the bin, otherwise they've got this thing called snow that comes. And now the, the crop will stay out in the field for seven, seven months. Not fun. So everybody's using desiccation, glyphosate. And uh, what it's doing to the whole system is, is scary. But the reason why is because they have this green and they have to, have to get rid of it because we're in a hurry. Whereas more holistic thinking would, would fix that. Uh, oh, that didn't come through all of that well, but you can, if you're close enough, you can see the pea pods up hanging um, in the canola. And it's probably a little picture there. Harvestability was really improved, especially if, uh, one of the, the jokes about peas, if anybody here ha has grown peas, the joke is the, the peas are scared of the combine because as they mature and it's getting close to harvest, then they want to lay down flat in the ground and hide from the combine. So they're really nasty to, they can't be nasty to, to harvest. So, so that was uh, oh, pretty, pretty close for finishing on time. <laughs> Questions, comments? The whole idea is 
once again, as Joel was saying, and you'll be getting deeper into this, about this, the, whether it's intercropping or really cover cropping or companion crop, whatever you want to call it, what input do we want to be focusing on? And once again, you know, how much nitrogen am I holding right now in my hand, percentage-wise, of nitrogen? Lots. So as Scottish Ukrainian, I got this free stuff here. Who do I have to partner with? Who do I have to work with to get this free stuff so I don't have to buy it? Yes. Another troublemaker. <laughs> um, speaking with growers as I go around these days, the biggest limitation to people wanting to adopt this is the limitations of the CBH and the limitations of our markets here in WA. From your experience in Canada, how culturally and across industry do people develop markets and open up markets so that they can grow these more diverse crops to get the benefits and then turn it into money? Because the guy that I spoke with up in Crew was then spraying out all these companions so he did take his weed off the top and then having issues with vet plumbing, lining up and all sorts of issues, yeah. I can bring up an email that I just got from a person from Eastern Saskatchewan. They want to grow oats and they want to put a, 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 a annual ryegrass, they want to put vetch, they want to put... I, I, I said, you're creating problems for yourself. Because in with the, I, the, with the annual ryegrass, it's about the same shape as oats. You can clean it out with, by blowing it out, but now you have more ryegrass for the next year, which... How do you deal with it? Uh, vetch. Great end fixer, how do you manage it? And this is where this, this really cover cropping works really well, where, and once again, it's going to be, you're gonna be doing a lot of this looking outside that what we were doing, and, and if you wanna see videos, I have videos of, of us bringing in a plane and seeding by plane into standing crop this high. So now, once again, I was looking at the forecast and yes, there's a storm coming, we're gonna be getting rain. And this is the, you know, when I look at the weather data from WA, you get a chunk of rain in August. So what a great opportunity. So by August, hopefully your crops are, <laughs> hopefully they're here, but are they here? Are they, who knows how high they're gonna be, but to bring in a plane, blow it on, when that plant is changing from, you know, it's getting into the reproductive, late reproductive stage, and if we're able to blow on some seed, so it germinates underneath that, we harvest our cash crop, now that vetch will grow from, you know, say September to January, what does that do? We have end fixation, we have root exudates, we have ground cover, we have, what's the downside? Whereas you see it, Exactly. The neighbors are going to laugh saying, that's a weedy field. <laughs> and I was, I was reported to the weed inspector twice by my neighbor because of all of these weeds I had out in my field that I was going to be grazing off. And it happened, just happened to be that the weed inspector, his daughter and my daughter were in the same volleyball team, so it was, um, neighbors say that you got a bunch of weeds. I said, yeah, there's Vasilia, it's, it's Sandfoin, it's Vetch, it's, oh, so what you doing with it? We're gonna graze it off. Okay, that's it. How the, how the girls doing? <laughs> so that was, the, but it's that whole, and this is where, you know, in Regen Ag, one of the things you need to do is have a, a support system. And that's whether it is WhatsApp, if it's Facebook, if it's you know, monthly meetings of where you get together like this, you need to have that support because your neighbors, your friends are going to try to talk you out of going down this route because no one else does it. We know that going out and buying 60 units of, of N and using herbicides and you, using that traditional system, it, in quotes, works, right? This. This is goofy. No one's doing it. I heard one of my friends say that he heard that someone tried it and it didn't work. So it's going to be something where it's developing that system. And so having oats and, or barley and, and vetch growing together, we need to know when they grow, how quick do they mature, how are they seeding it? Um, what's the tolerance of that buyer? of having a little bit of 
P, like when you, when you separate this, this is nice and easy because your seed size is completely different, so you can put it through a rotary cleaner and, and do a quick separation. When you start doing, dealing with it, okay, so will that canola buyer or that pea buyer, would they tolerate having one of those other crops in? Whereas when you start talking about, you know, uh, canola and vetch, how do you separate those two? You can't. So it's a bit of a nightmare from that standpoint. So it, it's going through and, you know, when we're doing these blends, what are your, what's your goal? Do you want to separate? Do you not want to separate? Do you, um, when we're going through, like one of the things as I'm driving around, you know, why isn't there canary seed being grown in WA? Where do they grow in Saskatchewan? In the desert. So why isn't that being grown here? Uh, sesame. They grow lots of sesame in, you know, Texas, in, in the northern part of Texas where it's dry and they treat it like dirt. They put it in the ground, they forget about it, and they come back and they harvest it. And it loves drought. Why isn't it growing here? Um, you know, there's a lot of these different crops we can diversify into. Um, my, I'm, I'm trying to, well, I suppose I'm really early stages with this regen farming. And, and some <coughs> of me, mate, is that like, I use my, my sister's an experienced conventional agronomist. Mm -hmm. and, and I've got to like, so, so two big questions is with this, system of cover crops, um, how do you explain ro rotations in your cropping system and um, you're supposed to use certain chemicals when you use certain crops, so when you mix those together and it's important to have the diversity of chemicals, how can you explain that please? Oh, <laughs> excellent question. Joel, do you want to spend a day <laughs> presentation on that one? It's going back, and, and that's where I said identifying weeds and what is their ecological advantage. <coughs> In North America, there's a beautiful book by J.L. McCammon, When Weeds Talk. And when, in the back of that book, it has a, a bunch of check marks of what advantage does it have over, you know, the key advantages it has. So when we're looking at dandelion, I know dandelion grows here, I think cape weed is what you call it. In other word, so what, why does dandelion cape weed? Why does it grow? What is it, its, its advantage? Anybody know? Deep, deep root. Deep root. And what's it looking for? What does it accumulate? Nitrogen. Nitrogen. Nitrogen, somewhat. Calcium. Calcium and phosphate. So if you ever watch animals and they're grazing, and they and you have some cape weed or dandelion out there, what do they graze first? What do you use for mineral supplement here? Any calcium? Yeah. So when these animals are going after something, that means it has those properties. And one of the things, once again, do you want to grow a field of dandelion or cape weed? No, not really, because number one, neighbors laugh at me. And number two, productivity is not all that great. But what it does, it's trying to fix the soil. And this is where, when we're looking at wild oats, a uh, really great example, because in my travels, I've never seen so many wild oats out in the countryside, or never mind the countryside, in Perth. I, you know, I've driven through a lot of cities through Canada. I've never seen wild oats in, in a city. Why are they growing? What are they doing? There's this free nitrate, and it's trying to tie up that free nitrate. And in a lot of cases, when we look at these weed systems, when we have these weed flushes, it's be, one of the reasons is because we have this, this, this nitrate flush in the system and these weeds are trying to, to, to fix it. So when we have a green plant in the vegetative stage, it solves a lot of these nutrient cycling. So when I was talking about these cap, catch, catch crops and we're dealing with Italian ryegrass, and once again, I'm gonna learn more species that are more adapted here, but if we can grow a grass that's going to grow this high and just be in the vegetative stage throughout that whole growing season, it's going to take that free nitrate, it's going to simulate it to, Joel? Remember? What did Joel say? Nitrate then gets converted to? And, and then when that, when that plant is only this high and that protein gets the 20% protein, that plant goes, why do I have so much protein in, the, in my system? What does it do? It pushes it back out. Lower, like early successional plants, what we call weeds, 
don't like using amino acids and proteins. Our higher plants that we want to grow, they can't. So this is where we have to change that system from over applying, especially nitrogen, to going back to spoon feeding. And once again, another, no, this isn't cheap plug, this is a good plug for you. Uh, sign up for his nitrogen management course. That's gonna change your weed pressure, it's gonna change your disease, it's gonna change your bugs. It's a really neat way of looking at farming, especially when we start throwing these legumes into these mixes. Because now we have that end source. Because what'll happen, what happens if you have really high nitrogen in the soil and you put down the legume? How well does it nodulate? It doesn't, why? Because it takes one third of, of a legume plant energy to fix nitrogen. So if it has free stuff, why would it spend the energy to get it, to make it, where they can use it for free? On the flip side, if it needs it, and you have that residual rhizobium in the soil, it can re-nodulate later in the season and start fixing nitrogen again. You'll have a lag in there, but these are the things that we want to be thinking about. So that's, you know, these are the challenges that we have is using that agronomist and, you know, getting them converted into regen thinking. Mm -hmm.